Sechis Kuv is Daf Pei Vav contains two Mishnayis, ending with the second Mishnah and all towards the end of the Daf. So the first part of the Daf is discussing various halachas of paying a Balchov, paying a lender, and paying a woman her Ksuba. The differences between the halachos. It also talks about what happens if somebody is Mochel, a Chov that he owes, and how he can use that to rip somebody off, and what happens in those situations. I'm going to get to the Mishnah, which we'll talk about. When a man can make his wife swear, is it A, if she's responsible for his business ventures, or B, even for the things that she does at home normally? So let's begin the Gemara. The Gemara is bringing a halacha that Shmuel has said, that somebody who sells a, a loan that he owns, that somebody owes him money and he sells the right to collect, he can then be moichel, the loan, he can be mochel and forgive the debt that is owed to him. Even though he sold the debt, he still owns it enough that he could be mochel the debt and forgive it. If he does that, the person who bought the debt is left with nothing. So the Gemara says, Rehud and Brayt of Yeshua said that if the person who bought the debt is smart, as soon as he buys the debt, he's going to go to the borrower who owes it, and he's going to give him a fuzuz, and he's going to make him write a new star. Otherwise, what's going to happen the borrower and the lender are going to realize, hey, they have nothing to lose here. The lender will just be mochel the star, forgive it in exchange for getting a few dollars from the borrower. Because anyway, otherwise the lender is not going to get anything because he sold it. So they're going to make this trick between them. And then the person who bought it, the buyer of the debt, is going to end up with nothing. So therefore, he better go get himself a new star from the borrower directly to him as the new owner of the debt. Otherwise, he's going to end up with zero. Now, the Gemara says, what happens in a situation where somebody actually does this, he sells the debt, and then he's mochel the debt. So he caused the loss. The person would have been able to collect the full face value of the debt. Obviously, he paid less for it, but he would be able to collect the full face value of the debt. And now he can't. This person ruined the debt that he was supposed to collect. That is, the lender who sold him the debt ruined it. So Gemara says he caused him a loss, but he didn't directly cause him a loss. He indirectly caused him a loss. It's called a garmi, a certain but indirect cause of loss. So that's a machogis in Mesachas uh, Baba Kama, the end of the Mesachta, is a person responsible to pay for an in the, for a loss that he caused um, for sure but indirectly. So Gemara says... According to the opinion, it says that he has to pay. Then he has to pay the full face value of the star. According to the one who says he does not have to pay, he only has to pay for the paper that the star is written on, which means he doesn't have to pay for anything. Because he will say, I sold you the paper. And you got the paper, so keep the paper. That's all it was worth. I don't have to pay you anything else. So there was an incident that happened, and Raphram forced Rav Ashi to pay the full amount like a beam used for artwork, meaning to say he made him pay the full solid amount of the star that he had caused the loss for. All right, now the Gemara brings another halach from Amemar. The Gemara says Amemar said the name of Rav Achama, that somebody who owes a ksuba to a woman and a debt alone to be repaid to the lender, and he has land and he has money. So who should he give the land? Who should he give the money to? So the Allah says he should give the money to the lender and he should give the land to the lady. Why? Because the lender lent him money. He has a right to get back money. The lady didn't give him anything. She just married him and therefore has a right to collect the ksuba and she was counting on the security of the land that he owes. Therefore, that is what she deserves to get, the land. Now, what if he only has uh, land and it's not enough for... Um, each of them, who should he pay first? So he should pay the Bachol first, and he'll pay the lady second. If he doesn't have enough, she's the one to lose. And the reason is, they both have an equal lien on the land. However, she is more determined to get married and more likely to forgive. If you're not going to give the lender the opportunity to collect in a situation where he's facing off against someone else, no one's going to lend. Women will still get married, and if... He, even if they stand to lose their ksuba in a situation like this. It's because they very much want to get married even more than a man does. Right, another one says that Rav Papa said to Rav Chama, is it true that you said that a if somebody wants to 
pay back a loan and Ole has his land, it's his responsibility to sell the land and turn it into cash and pay with cash. You can't just give the land and have the lender who collected it turn it into cash himself. So he said, no, it's not true. Never such a thing. Where do you get such an idea from? Tell me exactly what the story was that you are referring to. So he said the case of there was where somebody had money to pay back a loan and he was claiming that it's not his. He was claiming that it belongs to a guy. And therefore, they made him sell his land in order to get more cash. So he said, that's not a proof. Over there, he did something inappropriate. He was lying and saying he doesn't have cash when he has. And that's why they forced him to go sell his land. Okay. Now there was another question. I've kind of asked Rav Papa, and he said as follows. There's a machlokes when a person owes to, when he, when he has to repay a loan, money that he borrowed, does that mean that he he's holding on to someone else's money? He's holding on to the lender's money? Or is it his money now? He borrowed the money and now it becomes his. It enters his bank account, it's fully absorbed, and it's all his money. There is no dollar bill you could say belongs to the lender. He doesn't have to give any specific dollar bill to the lender. So what does the lender have on him? So the machlokes there, do you say that the lender really has money in his possession? He's the borrower is holding on to money that belongs to the lender, or do you say all he has is a mitzvah to pay, but he doesn't have anything that belongs to the lender? He just has an obligation. He has a mitzvah to pay. So that's a Rav Papa holds. He is going to you, Rav Papa, to say that there's just a mitzvah to pay. So what happens if he says I don't want to do a mitzvah? Okay, so fine, I don't want to pay. What are we supposed to do then? So I said, well, this is just like the mitzvah sasei, where we said the halacha is that even though you give only 40, which is really 39, a malchus for somebody who violates the mitzvah lo sasei, somebody refuses to do a mitzvah sasei, like he says, and I don't want to make a sukkah, or I don't want to shake a lulav, over there we have the right to give a malchus, adjutates in afshay, until the expiration of his soul. So here also, we could force him until the end. Umara now moves on to another sugya, and that is, what is the status of Tzidei Rishos Rabin? Now, the question is a situation where a Kenyan is supposed to be Chal, and that Kenyan has to be Chal in a public domain of sorts. So we have three domains. We're talking about Rishos Rabin, which is a public street. We're talking about Tzidei Rishos Rabin, which is the side of the street next to the wall where people don't usually go. That space is usually quiet and empty. People don't want to rub against the wall. And then we talk about the swamp that's out in the forest. So these three situations... Which ones are befitting for Kenyan to happen and which ones are not befitting for Kenyan to happen? So we've seen in our last mission that Rav and Shmuel said that a Kenyan can't happen in uh, Tzidei, that, that a Kenyan cannot happen in Rosh Hashanah. That is, if you left fruits piled in Rosh Hashanah at a time the Kenyan is supposed to take place, it can't take place. On the other hand, uh, Rav Nachman said that if it's an Agam, that's the opposite extreme, the Kenyan could take place. So the case he was discussing where somebody does a Kenyan Mashiach on a cow, and they say that it shouldn't take effect until 30 days later, at the time that the 30 days are over. Even if the cow is standing in the Agam, the Kenyan takes effect. If it wouldn't be standing in an Agam, if it would be standing in a place where the Kenyan cannot take effect, then the Kenyan wouldn't take effect at that time either. So the question is, what about Tzidei Rishos Rabbim? Does that fit like a Rosh uh, Hashanah, and therefore it's not kainah. Is that fit like an agam? And therefore it is kainah. So there's two versions of this Gemara, each one going a different way. So the Gemara's first version is that Rami Rechama asks for chizda. If a man gives a woman a get and says it should only be chal after 30 days, and then she puts it in tzidei Rosh Hashanah. So that's the question again. It can only be chal if it counts as a place where she could make a kinyan. So what happens there? So the Gemara wants to first say that it's not regreshes because it's just like Rosh Hashanah. And Rav and Shmuel said Rosh Hashanah, you can't make a kinyan. See, Rosh Hashanah is the same as Rosh Hashanah, you can't make a Kenyan. Then the Gemara said, one second, why shouldn't it be like Rav Nachman, where it's like an Agam? And it should be just like an Agam, just like an Agam, you could make a Kenyan. See, Rosh Hashanah, you should make a Kenyan. So, according to the first version, he said, no, you can't prove from Rav Nachman, and Agam and see, Rosh Hashanah, not the same halacha. Went to the second version, he originally brought the proof from Rav Nachman, and he said you should be able to make a Kenyan in Sidi Rosh Hashanah, just like Rav Nachman says you can make a Kenyan in the Agam. And he asked, what about Rish Lakish, uh, what about Rav and Shmuel, who said that you can make a Kenyan in Rosh Hashanah, and Sidi Rosh Hashanah could be like Rosh Hashanah. And the answer was, no, Sidi Rosh Hashanah and Rosh Hashanah are not the same thing. Sidi Rosh Hashanah has the din of Agam, not the din of a Rosh Hashanah. Now we get our next Mishnah, which is a short Mishnah, Machlokas between the Tanaim, and they will try to figure out what is Rabbi Lose's opinion. So the Mishnah says that if somebody points his wife over his property, that is, he sets her up in a, as a storekeeper, he sets up a 
business and puts her in charge of it, or he puts her in charge of his other possessions. So because she's managing his money, he has the right to make her swear at any time, just like anybody who hires someone to take care of his business has the right to make him swear at any time, has the right to make her swear at any time that she's not stealing and that she's running the business correctly. Now, Rabbi Leezer says he could even make her swear on her spindle and on the dough that she makes, other obligations that she has to him on a personal level, not business related, but household related. So everyone wants to know, what did Rabbi Eliezer say? He meant to say that once she's swearing on the business, he could also roll the shua to include the home matters? Or is he saying nothing to do with business? A man has a right to make his wife swear that she's taking care of the home correctly and she's not ripping him off as far as the dough and the spindle, the work and the home care that she's supposed to be doing. So the is going to try to bring a proof which one Rabbi Eliezer meant. Did he mean that you can only make her swear on home care when she's swearing on business? Or did he mean that you can make her swear on home care even if she's not swearing? swearing on business. So the most first attempt is we know there's a price that expands on Rabbi Eliezer's opinion. And it says, And the Chachamim said to Rabbi Eliezer, how could you make her swear whenever he wants her to? A person can't live with a snake in a basket. It's too hard to keep track of him all the time, which implies that she has a complaint that she shouldn't have to swear because all the time is going to make her swear. So if you're saying, if Pshadon Rabbi Eliezer is that he can make her swear any time for her home care, so I understand. You can't make her swear for her home care. Um, that's too, then the Chamin uh, uh, are saying she has, she can't breathe every time he could just show up and make her swear at any instant. However, if you say that Rabbi Eliezer only said that he could make her swear when she was swearing anyway for business, so anyway she's swearing for business. Why is it any harder for her to swear for business and for home care once he can make her swear for business that doesn't add any burden to her if he makes her swear for home care as well? So the Gemara says, no, it is possible that when she said, when the Chachamim said, for her sake, they tied it for her, she can't live with the snake, they didn't mean any moment she's going to have to swear. She meant the fact that he's not trusting her to take care of the home properly and he's making her swear, that is being a snake. And it's not about frequency of the shul, it's about how deeply he's asking her to swear. Now the Gemara's second proof, so that rejects the first proof. Now the Gemara's second proof is also from an expanded b'risa, which expands the machok, so it became the uh, Rabbi Eliezer and the Chachamim. And this one is a final proof. So this b'risa says as follows. Somebody who did not patter his wife from a nether, he did not absolve her of swearing, or shvua, so that is two types of uh, swearing, a nether is a promise or a shvua, and he set her up as his storekeeper or in charge of his possessions, he can make her swear any time she want, he wants. If he did not set her up as a storekeeper in charge of his business or in charge of his possessions, he cannot make her swear. Says Rabbi Eliezer, even though he did not set her up as a storekeeper or as a business manager, he can make her swear anytime she wants because she's always somewhat responsible for his finances because she deals with the spindle and she deals with the dough. Those are monetary things that belong to him that she has to deal with. On that, the Chachamim said, you can't live with a snake in a basket. So you see, clearly Rabbi Lezer was saying, even in the case where she is not swearing for business matters, still he can make her swear for home matters. And that's the final proof that that's what he meant. Now we get to our last Mishnah, and this is a lengthy Mishnah, which will take us to the end of the daf. Mishnah discusses a case where a man gives his wife a pass and promises her she's not going to have to swear. And there are three levels of what he could say, and each level gives a higher level patur. So the first level is where he says, I'm never going to make you swear. So then he can never make her swear, but he could make her inheritors or those who buy her rights swear. If she sells her property or she sells her rights to other people, he can make them swear if she sells her job. However, if he sells, I'm not if he says I'm not gonna make you swear or any people who come in succession of you, then he can't make her swear. He can't make those people who come after her or her inheritors swear, but his inheritors could make her or her inheritors swear. If he says, though, this is the third level, I'm not going to make you swear, and I'm not going to make anyone who comes in place of you swear, and anyone who comes in place of me cannot make anyone who comes in place of you or you yourself swear, then he can't make her swear, he can't make her inheritor swear, can't make people who buy her out swear, and those who buy him out or inherit him cannot make her or her inheritors or her successors swear. So no one can make anybody swear. However, that's only true if there's no business involved. And she goes home from the time that he dies, she goes home to her father's house, he's not involved in the business. If, however, she is a business manager on their business that they inherited, they can make her swear from then on. They can't make her swear from anything from then 
past because he was she was promised she wasn't going to have to. But from now, if she's working as a business, this is a new thing, and they are allowed to make her switch.